Hi there, ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Workman, and this is going to be your screencast session five for exploring the cellular basis of life. Let's get to it right away. Make sure you have some notes, um, note paper to take notes on. All right, everybody? So here it is. Uh, what we're going to focus on today is um, talking about the differences, a little bit of the differences between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells, but really what we're going to talk about is how prokaryotic cells are very similar to some of the parts of eukaryotic cells, uh, the parts that eukaryotic cells have. These are your particular learning targets today. Specifically, we're going to learn about the endosymbiotic theory, uh, and you're going to need to be able to explain uh, the endosymbiotic theory, what it is. And uh, another target that I want you guys to know about is understanding how to use endosymbiotic theory in order to explain what we call the inner membrane system found within eukaryotic cells. And I want you to know at least four pieces of evidence that support what we call endosymbiotic theory. <clears throat> All right, now, you do have this diagram in your unit booklet, and what this diagram is, is a fully labeled diagram of an, a typical animal cell. Now, what you're seeing here, of course, is that this would be a eukaryotic cell. A eukaryotic cell. You can tell it's a eukaryotic cell because of this large feature right here, which, of course, is the nucleus. And you can tell that that's the nucleus because it's labeled as such, and these are all these different parts within the nucleus. Some other features of this cell that would indicate that it's a eukaryotic cell, of course, are these membrane-bound organelles such as these mitochondria, all of this stuff. This is Golgi apparatus. This is endoplasmic reticulum. Um, and then there's membrane, obviously, surrounding the nucleus. When we think about the membrane surrounding the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum, and the Golgi apparatus, that's what we're referring to when we are discussing the inner membrane system. So if we go back to target two here, the inner membrane system, that's what we're talking about. This membrane around the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum, and the Golgi apparatus. You can tell this is not a plant cell because there are no chloroplasts, there is no central vacuole, and there's no cell wall. It just has this outer membrane. Um, and of course, no plasmodesmata structure, which is what we see in plant cells as well. Obviously, these other features and uh, structures within the cell are labeled as well. This is a diagram that you should probably spend some time with getting to know. Um, we're going to expect that you know all these different parts of what they are and what they do. This is a general schematic diagram of a plant cell. And I can tell this is a plant cell right away because of two main features. This structure right here, that's a chloroplast, of course, and these little tiny structures inside. Um, we're going to get to know what those are soon here. And then, uh, obviously, this sort of uh, robust-looking structure, that's, that's cell wall. And then the little tubes within the cell wall, those are the plasmodesmata. You don't see cell wall in animal cells, these, so this is a plant cell. You have this diagram in your unit booklet as well. Um, obviously, plant cells and animal cells, again, they're eukaryotic. We've got a nucleus here, uh, not prokaryotic cells. Um, <clears throat> not found in animal cells, of course. Um, we don't see lysosomes, excuse me, not plant, found in plant cells. Uh, we don't see lysosomes in plant cells, and we don't see centrals, and um, typically you don't see flagella. What I want you guys to appreciate right now is when we think about prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. This is a whole bunch of information about prokaryotes. Now this is a chart. I don't want you to spend a ton of time copying this down. We're probably going to make a photocopy of this chart and hand it out to you in class. But as you look at um, prokaryotes and look at these different aspects of prokaryotes, the, the what kind of DNA they have, how they replicate, what, what are their ribosomes like, um, uh, the electron transport chain uh, series of reactions that occur within the, this type of cell, the size, and you know when these prokaryotes appeared on Earth. Just look down this column of information. And what I want you to notice is how different that is from eukaryotes. But then when you think about these particular structures, which we find in eukaryote cells, mitochondria and chloroplasts, what I want you to see is how similar this information is and how similar this information is 
mitochondria and chloroplast information when we look back at prokaryotes. So when you look at all that information, it's pretty obvious how similar prokaryotes are to the membrane-bound organelles found in eukaryotes. These are mitochondria and chloroplasts. Now, this information has led to the development of what we call endosymbiotic theory, and this is one of your main targets here. And these are the three tenets, or the three main ideas of endosymbiotic theory. Going back to this information, we see that prokaryotes, again, are very similar in their features to mitochondria and chloroplasts. And so from that information, the logical conclusion or the logical idea that has, has sprung forth from that is that the cellular organelles of mitochondria and chloroplasts, uh, the, the cellular organelles mitochondria and chloroplasts of eukaryotic cells were likely originally free-living unicellular prokaryotes. The endomembrane system, that's the, the uh, membrane around the nucleus, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus. <clears throat> The thought is, is that develops from the infolding of prokaryotic cell membrane. Um, and if you think about the strategies to avoid the surface area to volume ratio problem that cells have when they get bigger, one of the main strategies is to create folded membrane structures. So what that does is it increases surface area, but not necessarily the volume as much. The idea that this my mitochondria and chloroplasts were once free-living prokaryotes and the endomembrane system happened as a result of infolding of prokaryotic cell membrane. Um, how, how does that happen? Well, the idea here is that prokaryote elements could have entered a host cell. Um, we know that some cells eat other cells for nutrient purposes. And the thought is, is that maybe we had one cell entering into another cell literally being engulfed but that cell that was ingested wasn't actually digested. It wasn't hydrolytically broken down. And the idea is that the cell that was engulfed actually helped the cell that engulfed it in a way that we call uh, symbiosis. And symbiosis is two separate organisms living together. And this idea of obligatory symbiosis, now what that means is that two organisms are living together in such a way that they cannot uh, any longer live apart from one another. So this is a schematic, this is a diagram that shows you the possibilities of how an ancient prokaryotic organism having the surface area to volume issue because it's getting bigger avoids that surface area to volume proportion issue by starting to fold in its membrane. And the idea here is that this folded membrane actually starts to surround the nucleoid region and the nucleoid region being protected now is fairly developed or fairly called a, a nucleus. And this prevents, uh, presents a, a, an, ad, a, an advantage because protecting the DNA with a layer of membrane or two layers of membrane is going to prevent some um, uh, harm to the DNA molecule or, or it's going to uh, decrease the rate of mutation. Um, pockets of membrane within the cell essentially sort of hollows out the cell, which reduces the volume capacity of the cell, but it doesn't really um, uh, change the exterior surface area, but what it does do is it effectively reduces the volume. So again, that improves the surface area to volume proportion that we talked about in screencast session three. Engulfing one cell into another cell, this is this is how, in some instances, cells eat, so to speak. And if this were to happen, but these inner uh, now cells inside were not digested, we start to get this symbiotic, uh, mutually beneficial uh, relationship that occurs. And we know some prokaryotes today are heterotrophic. That means they go out and look for other nutrient resources. Uh, and some prokaryotes in, in you know today, the modern era, are are um, autotrophic, which means they probably photosynthesize. And so if we think about engulfing a prokaryotic cell that was originally autotrophic and photosynthetic, we now think of those uh, of chloroplasts as originally those cells that were engulfed, and we now think of mitochondria as originally heterotrophic prokaryotes that were, that were engulfed but not digested.
And so the end result of this is that we have plant cells and animal cells that are eukaryotic that have a membrane-bound nucleus that have an endomembrane system as well as membrane-bound organelles such as mitochondria and chloroplasts. This is a, a diagram schematic that shows you literally how a, a larger cell can engulf a different cell. Um, and we see this happening. Uh, uh, amoeba cells and other protists actually have this engulfing behavior. Even your white blood cells can engulf cells that are infecting you. Um, <clears throat> and this is just the engulfment process, or the, what we call phagocytosis. Um, and when we think about if a membrane were to engulf, a, or a section of membrane of a larger cell were to engulf a smaller cell, the result is that you'd have two layers of membrane because the cell would have its original membrane and the engulfed cell membrane would surround that original membrane. And when we look at mitochondria, one of the features of mitochondria is that there are two, there are two membranes. There is an inner membrane and an outer membrane. And so the double layer of membrane well, why does that exist? Well, this engulfing idea, this phagocytosis idea, explains why those two membranes exist. <clears throat> when you think about the nucleus, it's basically a, a segment uh, of area where DNA is um, housed and protected, and we see membranes surrounding it, and we see endoplasmic reticulum as a contiguous membrane system with that nuclear envelope. The, of course, the, um, we postulate that this endomembrane system comes from the infolding strategy that cells must have employed to improve their surface area to volume ratio. This is a schematic cartoonish diagram of a chloroplast, and what I want you to notice is that this too has outer and inner membrane, two layers of membrane. So like a mitochondria, chloroplast having double layers of membrane. Why does it have two layers of membrane? Well, the thought is, is that it was also engulfed as the mitochondrion was. <clears throat> when you look at the parts of a uh, mitochondrion, there are four main parts that you should really think about knowing and uh, understanding. Uh, the first, number one here, labeled here, is just an inner membrane. That would have been the original membrane of the prokaryote that was engulfed. Number two is the outer membrane. And then number three is really pointing at the space between the inner membrane and the outer membrane. We call that the inner membrane space. And there's a series of critical biochemical reactions that occur across that membrane. And then inside of the inner membrane, we refer to that as the matrix. So let's talk about some evidence to support the endosymbiotic theory. Um, first of all, you can go back to that chart that I alluded to a few slides ago, but the thing that to, we want to talk about here is that mitochondria and chloroplasts actually do have their own DNA, and it's circular. And <clears throat> the DNA that bacteria have and the DNA that mitochondria and chloroplasts have are remarkably similar. When you look at the overall size of mitochondria and chloroplasts, they're about the same size as modern prokaryotes. When you look at the double membranes of mitochondria and chloroplasts, this supports the idea that they may have originally been engulfed by another layer of membrane. And also the inner membrane itself has some peptidoglycan-like structures within it, but not exactly like peptidoglycan, but they're similar to cell membranes that we find in, in modern prokaryotes. Mitochondria and chloroplasts actually do divide within your own cells independently. They go through a process that's very much like binary fission, which is just a simple one cell splitting into two process. Uh, mitochondria and chloroplasts do that just like bacteria do. And here's a really interesting thing. Mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own ribosomes, which are actually smaller. This, they're measured in what we call Svedbergs. Um, they're smaller than the ribosomes that are found in the endoplasmic reticulum or free-floating in the cytoplasm of eukaryotic cells. 80 Svedberg uh, ribosomes are found in eukaryotic cytoplasm. So when we take all this evidence together, we think we understand uh, how simple cells became complex cells from about three and a half billion years ago to about one and a half billion years ago. Um, mitochondria, Golgi apparatus, endoplasmic reticulum, uh, nuclear envelope, and the nucleus itself, and just the overall size of eukaryotic cells compared to prokaryotic cells. Endosymbiotic theory explains how this is possible.
for both plant cells and animal eukaryotic cells. So that's it for today, ladies and gentlemen. The next screencast is going to be um, uh, screencast session six. I do hope that you can explain the basics of endosymbiotic theory now and use the, I, the process of infolding a membrane to get around the surface area to volume issue, uh, that part of endosymbiotic theory to explain why the inner membrane system, the Golgi apparatus, the, endos, uh, the endoplasmic reticulum, and the nuclear envelope exist in eukaryotic cells. And I hope you know at least four pieces of evidence. You were given five, uh, four pieces of evidence that support the endosymbiotic theory. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we'll see you next time.